Welcome to this final session of the uh, eighth summit on the global agenda. What our task now in the last hour here uh, is really to uh, nothing less but bringing it all together. And what we really want to bring together are these two pillars of the summit, the global challenges that we have made uh, a central point of uh, the, the, the cross-council interactions that we, that we had, um, and on the other hand, the fourth industrial revolution that we explored uh, in particular in uh, this uh, fascinating plenary last night in this, in this room, and um, reflecting on how this changing context of the fourth industrial revolution um, is really um, creating a new context for, for addressing these global challenges. The panel last night um, elaborated on how the confluence of these different technological changes is really creating a fundamental change in the, in the systems, in the technological business systems um, that, uh, that we are embedded in. But what's the corresponding systems change in the way we address these global challenges? That's really what we want to explore here with this, with this panel. And we have a distinguished panel. Um, let me briefly introduce uh, Diana Farrell, uh, CEO of the JP Morgan Chase Institute, um, Sarah Manka, um, founder and, and, and CEO of uh, uh, Grow Intelligence uh, from Kenya, um, Elda Shafir, professor of uh, psychology and uh, public affairs uh, at Princeton University, uh, and last but not least, Nairi Woods, uh, dean of the Blavatnik School of Government at Oxford University. But before I turn to you, uh, I'd like to turn to the audience and hear from some of uh, the, uh, the discussions you will have had in the discussions on, on, on global challenges. Um, and particularly what I'd like to hear is, what's the one thing that challenged your thinking on, on these issues, on these known issues? Maybe, uh, Peter Maurer, if, if I may turn to you first. Um, you, you have um, been part of uh, some of these uh, discussions, particularly on the, on the refugee crisis. What, what really challenged your thinking on these, on, on these issues? The colleagues will bring you a mic any second. An innovation which is uh, throwing mics. Uh, the one thing I have learned, and I would uh, like to pick you up with the two challenges, uh, what evolved my thinking here is actually a triangular thinking because uh, there is this huge opportunity, and Klaus has mentioned in the uh, survey yesterday, uh, in the room here that there is a huge opportunity and expectations on the fourth industrial revolution. We have those wonderful challenges and all the work which has been done, but there is sort of the dark side of it, and this is the fragility, violence, and conflict which becomes the new normal. And refugee crises and population movements and violence destroying some of the advancements in development and uh, the Millennium Development Goals that we have seen in the past. So I think we have to be careful to look not only at the challenges and the potential of the fourth industrial revolution, but also look at the fragility as the new normal in many countries, at uh, uh, injustice uh, basically undercutting the justice system, corruption undercutting the justice system, uh, population movement, undercutting development gains, and looking at those triangular dynamics and to look for uh, opportunities that uh, the three parts of the equation would give uh, has probably advanced most during the time here. Right. Thank you. So putting, putting those opportunities of the, of the fourth industrial re revolution in, in context. Rosemary uh, Feenan, um, your focus on, on, on cities, what, what stood out uh, to you as, as sort of the main uh, takeaway that, that challenged your thinking on these, on these issues, and, and what role do, do cities play in that? Thank you. Here's an interesting statistic from my colleague Nick Brook. Did you know that in Hong Kong, 50% of people live above the 16th floor? That's three and a half million people living up there in the air. 
it made us think that one of the challenges of densification, which is what we think is absolutely necessary in our cities if we are to fit 70% almost of 9.6 billion people in cities by 2050, the big issue is how to densify well. Then you turn to somewhere like Kensington and Chelsea in London, for those of you that know it. One of the densest parts, believe it or not, of London proves that densification doesn't have to be high rise and densification can be pretty nice. But I think our challenge to ourselves was how do we create guidelines that give good density for cities that are a different part of their evolution in different cultures with different expectations? And that's a big challenge. It's one that we all feel is an absolute essential if we're to get away from the fact that forecasts suggest that the 3% of the Earth's surface that's currently covered by cities may well double or even treble if we don't do something about containing good growth in good cities that serve citizens well. Thank you. So cities as, a, as an agent for change. Ch Chang Hao Wu, when, when you had discussions on, on, on climate and, uh, and, and the global challenge on environment and, and resource security, what, what stood out to you as, as, as the main challenge to your thinking about those issues? Uh, system change becomes the, probably the weakest link to address global challenges, challenges around environment and natural resources security, um, particularly working on the climate change issues there. A few five words or phrases actually of the, my observation coming out of the discussion in the last couple of days. One is the inspiration. I feel very, very inspired by the emerging consensus from this community actually in the last few days that recognizing the importance of system change. And uh, yes, we are innovating technologies, we're doing a lot of things, but we still cannot address the challenge, which is overdone, you know, just overly, overwhelmingly daunting to us. So system change becomes fundamentally the way to go forward. Second word is really the failure, the system failure. The why we wouldn't be able to meet the challenge is because the systems we have today have pretty much failed us actually on the environment and natural resources and climate change issues there. That's why the leading up to the third word is redesign of the system. So we need to reform, transform the systems we're operating today. If we do not have the determination and commitment to do that, we would not be able to succeed actually in tackling climate change issues. The fourth phrase is actually is really the empathy or empathic civilization. Because whatever system we're going to redesign is done by people. Done by people of this generation but also future generations there. So it's going to be very important, actually, we develop the common, actually, empathy from this generation, but also among people, but also to nature. I think that's going to be really, really fundamentally important. The last point is the, the word is really together. And uh, so whatever we're going to do, we need to come together, really address that. It's not like a, your business or government or business or whatever. It's us all together. So fundamentally, we have to come together on this journey to really start this system transform or re reform so that we'll be able to address the situation in a successful manner. Thank you. And empathy is at the heart of that systems change, if I, if I understood you uh, rightly. Uh, Gera Fairburg, um, you made the point yesterday uh, at the uh, uh, plenary on the fourth industrial revolution that we really need to think about whether uh, or not that fourth industrial revolution helps us advance the uh, sustainable development goals. Um, do you subscribe to that, that point that Chang Ha Wu mentioned about uh, empathy at the heart of the, of, the, of the systems change that we need? Yes, I would answer um, it is also the need for uh, cross-sectoral uh, thinking and I would say no improvement, for instance, uh, on climate change if you don't incorporate agriculture and food production being part of the problem of climate uh, change into uh, uh, part of the solution of climate uh, change. That's one thing. Another thing is, uh, I think, that um, is the recognition that we will not be able to implement the, um, the Agenda 2030 uh, um, and Zero Hunger, and we will not address other topics if we don't allow the multi-stakeholders, bottom-up, uh, come to the table, uh, defend their interest or bring their interest uh, to the table, and create win-win partnerships. I think uh, without uh, multi-stakeholder approach, we will not uh, succeed as well. And finally, 
um, I think uh, I will commend you with your panel today because I'm struck by the uh, suggestion that we should really make work of um, equal opportunities and equal positioning of women. Um, and I would uh, commend, recommend to um, follow up on the uh, uh, no uh, one, no, no men, no manual, no, no manual uh, uh, movement. Um, and which and is aside from aside from the fact that we have a, yeah, uh, a very well uh, gender diverse panel, what was the one thing that, uh, that that really challenged your thinking here in these in these conversations? Well, I think it's uh, it's bringing uh, women to uh, to equal opportunity, equal access uh, to financing, to uh, uh, to lend in our in our case, asset services, uh, etc. Uh, and also allow uh, women uh, in better in uh, decision uh, uh, making. I think it's it's time to real move this. Excellent, M M Mitchell Baker. If I <laughs> Mitchell Baker, if I may turn to you uh, as as part of the discussion on the future of the internet, what what stood out to you as sort of the main challenge to your thinking about about those questions? Our discussion of the internet was surprising in the degree to which the human element came up, and in particular the question of trust. Starting with the internet and building out from that, how do we build trustworthy institutions and systems going forward? I think the internet itself is not the source of the question, but the information flow reveals things that weren't broadcast as clearly before, and so we find ourselves living in a crisis of confidence and trust in institutions. And so we talked about how might one make an institution trustworthy, not the human emotional response, which is often wrong, <laughs> about whether I trust something, you know, doesn't make it trustworthy. So what are the traits and conditions starting from openness or transparency into understanding, into the groundswell, bottom-up engagement, into having enough confidence in the systems to allow systems change, and how do we actually do that when the systems we need for the future are so different from those of the past. So the question of how do we make the kind of systemic and structural and systematic changes that we need across the global institutions, we found over and over again, has the critical element of human trust at the center of it. So trust and, and, and systems change, really, that, 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 that seems to have resonated across, across those, those issues. Maybe if I turn, turn to the panel now, uh, Diana, as part of, uh, you're part of the uh, GSC on the future of government. Um, if you're thinking about those, those questions that we posed to, to, the, to, to the panel, what, are, what is the systems change? Help us understand uh, this point that seems to be so, uh, so um, prominent in those discussions. What, what, what does that systems change consist of? And what, what, what does it mean for our established organizational structures uh, through which we're looking at these, at these problems. The, um, the Future of Government pan, uh, GAC spent a, a lot of time on this question of what is the idealized future, which would be a dramatic system change, and what is the idealized sort of um, elements of what a truly functioning future of government would be. Uh, and most of the discussion was on do we see even glimmers or seeds of that in certain actions that governments have taken and what would be the path forward for that. Uh, certainly trust would be an important element to it. But I think as I reflect on many of our discussions within the future of government and other conversations I've had with folks here, I'm sort of struck by the fact that what people get most excited about, and I would say many in very different fields, is the power that um, the data, technology, uh, et cetera, allows us in its granularity, in, in the ability to understand ourselves ever better by processing more and more finite and more and more specialized views of the world. And that's wonderful, and, and I would say this group is an example of it. Um, but at the same time, how the tension with the need for integration across this, um, and in government, it's particularly acute because when you think of all the functions of government, there are so many uh, that are so varied and rely on very different kinds of expertise and very different kinds of data, and the mechanisms to tie them together are almost non-existent. I would say when you go beyond government and 
and to, to include business, the problem just mushrooms, in effect. And, and so this, this question of are we investing enough in the institutions that will n enable the platforms that bring the depth and verticality to the need for integration? And I would say I don't think we are. And I'll, I'll give one example that is very near and dear to my heart because it's sort of what I'm working on now at the, uh, at the Institute, which is um, if we are going to understand our, ourselves through big data, behavioral science, and huge data sets, uh, which I think is essential for all the problems we're trying to solve with the global challenges, we're going to a, have to be able to get different perspectives, i.e. the J.B. Morgan Chase perspective and the World Bank perspective and the uh, IMF perspective and the BIS perspective to have a common platform to connect dots. And we are so far away from that. I would say even individual organizations, many of you who run organizations know, you don't even know what you know within your organization. And, and so that tension of granularity and the power that comes from uh, detail, but the, the lack of thought and infrastructure around connecting these, either um, technology infrastructures or governance uh, structures, are, 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 I think, the big takeaway for me. Right. And Sa Sarah, you, you have actually created a company that is tying together this data. Um, exactly in, in, in a particular field in, in, in food and agriculture. Is, is technology allowing us these days to, to step out of these dilemmas? And, 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 and what, what is the right place to, uh, to drive those innovations? Um, I, th I think it is. <laughs> Hopefully I'm right. Um, but I, th I think it touches on, on Diana's point, which is um, the, I think the, net, the need for depth in a particular subject matter means that now you have to think about, as you're, I guess, building technologies that go vertically deep, you have to think about the whole ecosystem. And so it's, it's you ultimately, I think our starting point for the creation of technologies has to be, what is the world we want to see, right? And then if you know what the world you want to see is, then you actively design for the world. And I think for us to do that, I think, A, there is a lot of knowledge and a lot of um, beyond data, I think there's a lot of just pure scientific research sitting out there today that's waiting to be applied to something. And so I think for, for a, a successful, harmonious integration between breadth and depth, you need a lot of work done in, in kind of bringing to light what is being done in the research community and applying it to real world problems, right? So I think in some ways the way I think about it is if you had to relive the industrial revolution of the US, right? So we're talking about the fourth industrial revolution, right? So there's Vanderbilt with rail, Rockefeller with oil, Carnegie with steel, um, JP Morgan with power, and then Ford with um, cars. Mm -hmm. so if you had to reconstruct that world that actually enabled this infrastructure to be built, I think it's effectively a world you know, of bridges built by nanorobots using graphene where driverless cars are being driven off of it and we're eating synthetic meat. All of these components are actually sitting within deep science communities and I think they're waiting to be discovered and applied. But I think the starting point is ultimately actually what is the world we want to see? And then from there, we have to actually actively go out and seek and, and almost redesign the world we want. And so I guess, yes, um, you know, technology has a big role to play, but I think it has to be done simultaneously with thinking systems. And systems is ultimately, I think, what Gerda was referring to, which is kind of the full um, stakeholder right. Right. list. And, and when we're referring to some of these, these principles, do, do we have a representative from the Council on Software and Society in the room? Anyone in, in, in the back? Um, tell us about the work that you've been proposing to, uh, to do uh, in applying some of the principles from, uh, from, from software uh, to the world of government. Uh, great. Thank you very much. My name is Victoria Spinell. I have the great pleasure of chairing the Agenda Council on the Future of Software and Society. So I think we are very concerned about the fact that things are very, changing very quickly. Um, software innovation is dramatically redesigning and disrupting the world. Um, and we're in this period of rapid and exponential change, as we've all been talking about. And what we've been looking at is to see whether or not there are principles that can be drawn from software development to make governments more agile in how they govern and how they make policy decisions. Um, so we've been 
uh, immersed in a very intense um, and really interesting discussion to see what we can do to try to take some of those principles from technology development and software development and offer them to governments as a new paradigm, as a new set of norms for how to make policy and how to govern. Thank you. Diana, in, in, in your experience, having worked with, with governments and in government, um, to what extent do you, do, do you need these principles from the software uh, industry and, 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 and software thinking in, in, in government, and, and what difference can that yeah. make? Oh, I think it would be profoundly different and better. Um, and so you realize that in government and policy making and the execution of policy, it takes so long to to actually pass legislation or execute large programs that by the time they're actually in place, they've almost become obsolete. And there are very few mechanisms for the feedback loops that, that are classic in the software industry that say, th these three aspects of something worked, let's double down on those, these two did not, let's change them. I mean, if you think of even very large pieces of legislation, in the US we had the healthcare reform bill, we had Dodd-Frank, uh, everybody loves to hate both of these behemoths, but the, the better attitude toward it would be to say, okay, these things have passed through a first process, and we're constantly thinking about improving on the margin. Everything that we know works, we double down on. Anything we know doesn't work, we change. Um, that's, not, that's not how we're either the legislative process or I would say even the government process, because budgets in administrations don't enable that kind of uh, flexibility and change. Um, so I think if we're thinking about the future and ideal, and we've talked about this in our, our uh, future of government, it, it would have that element of experimentation and quick change and fast turnaround. Um, I, I'm, I'm not so optimistic that that can be done very easily, but, but, but if we could edge the world in that direction and governments in that direction, very powerful. So what would you make you more optimistic that you, that, that could be implemented faster? Uh, I'm not sure. I think, um, you know, th th everyone has said this too many times, but, but we have a, an, a, a sort of disconnect between people who are really trying to do things and address real problems and kind of the, the political show that has become people taking positions and, and playing a very different game of, of to and fro on that dimension. And I think connecting those and, and actually having closer accountability on, on those issues and, and, and really judging politicians and uh, secretaries and others on their jobs and not on sort of random political narratives would actually help a lot. Right. <laughs> Edda, let, let me turn to you and, and the people dimension of that. Um, yes. And uh, Diana mentioned the point about trial and error in, uh, in, in, in government. Now, that's something that resonates with you, I guess, in, in terms of applying principles of behavior science to, uh, to public policy. What, in your view, what's, what's holding us back from, from applying these, these principles more widely at the international level in terms of glo solving global problems? Well, I mean, I think the, the number one insight that comes from behavioral research, and it, it, I want to make sure it doesn't sound sophisticated, I, mean, I don't mean to sound postmodern, it's actually very trivial, is the fact that when you present people, say, with two options to choose from, they don't choose between those two options. They choose between those two options as they are represented in a three-pound machine that we have behind the eyes and between the ears. And that's not a trivial fact, because the same two outcomes in the world can be seen many different ways. Very small nuances in how you describe the option, what the option is, how it's situated, what's next to it, will alter how people think and how they're represented. And that has an enormous impact. It changes everything. You know, how do people feel about an electric car? Well, what are, how are they thinking about it? Here is a, here is a simple question. Uh, do people feel better commuting to work in a BMW or a Ford Escort? You call people, ask them what car are you driving, and how do you feel commuting today? And you get a very clear effect. BMWs are more fun than Ford Escorts. You do a second condition. You call them again, ask them, how is the drive today, and what car are you driving? If you, meant, if you fail to mention the car when you ask me how I drive, there is no effect, no difference in BMWs and Ford Escorts. So now, is it worth buying a BMW? If I think about it while I drive, it turns out it's worth it. If I don't think about it, I have the same, same exact experience. When we think about many issues, trust, empathy, design of government, the same outcome can be seen in very different ways depending on the nuances of how it's presented, what people think about what they bring to mind. 
And that's a very critical element because if you describe it in one way as opposed to another, everything changes in ways that have an enormous impact. And that's a lot of the behavioral research really looks at those nuances and how to describe them to people. What comes to mind? What kind of behaviors you get as a result? Even something as profound as a social norm, which is kind of a really collective outcome, is in tension with people's attitudes. So we know, for example, very nice research that people's attitudes move faster than social norms. And what that means is most likely most people in this room today feel more ready for gender equity than they perceive the norm to be. This is beautiful research in segregation in the US in the 50s. Most Americans were ready to get rid of it, but thought that the country was not. And so these are very interesting nuances where human attitude and, and perception are in tension, or at least are not always aligned with collective phenomena, collective perceptions, in ways that can have a, a very profound effect. People mentioned empathy. I'll give one last example. Empathy is a profound issue. And the psychology of empathy, about which we know just a little, does not follow standard normative rules. The impulse we have is to tell you how terrible things are and give you statistics. As many of you suspect, if you get people, if you gauge people's attitude toward giving for philanthropic causes, seeing a picture of a single child generates many more contributions, and many higher contributions than seeing a statistic. In fact, seeing the picture of the child with the statistics gets you to give less than the picture alone. It's basically distracting you from having a full relationship with this child. There is beautiful lit literature that asks, you know, when, where, where is the collapse of empathy? What numbers do we stop being, stop caring? And there's beautiful authors who have written about this. How many millions do you need before you stop caring? The answer, the behavioral, empirical answer is roughly two. If I give you a picture of one child, you give X. If I give you a picture of more than one child, you give less than X. Now, you can see the tension here. I mean, are we going to be paternalistic and treat child, people like children and give them one picture the way we do to our second grader? Or are we going to respect them and give them statistics and get less out of them? And this is a profound tension where how you design things and the collective outcomes you get depend on sort of understanding the nuances of individual perception and behavior and, and working with them. And you say attitudes change faster than social norms. Institutions, in a way, change relatively slow in, 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 in that regard. Um, now, to what extent do you see uh, behavioral units, nudge units, in, in these large international organizations that are um, tasked with uh, carrying, um, carrying out some of the progress on these, on these global issues? Well, you know, um, so far, these behavioral units have, have been wise in looking for low-hanging fruit. Some things you can do very easily. There is data on changing the defaults, for example, on options. It could be savings for retirement and it could be organ donations among drivers. There is fantastic data if you look at the rates of organ donors among drivers in different European countries. Six countries average 94% of drivers are willing organ donors. Another five countries average 14%, so 94 to 14. If you look at the countries, it's Germany on one side, Austria on the other, and Netherlands on one side, Belgium on the other. What's doing? What's doing is the 94% are opt out. Unless you opt out, you're an organ donor. And the 14% are opt in. Unless you opt in, you're not a donor. The transaction cost is signing the back of your license. It's trivial. And think about it. We're not talking about selling orange juice. It's your body, your family, your religious beliefs. Just changing the default on a form changes completely the country in which you drive. So that's a low-hanging fruit. We can do a lot with it quickly. People have been saving a lot more for retirement by changing the default. Other things, of course, you know, I'm from Israel. The Israeli-Palestinian problem doesn't seem to be lending itself to that so easily. So there's a lot more to do. So tying together the different uh, data sets in, uh, in government, using technology, understanding the behavior of people, is, is, is that enough in a way to... Uh, uh, to redesign institutions, to, uh, to enact that systems change that uh, uh, people have called for. Nairi, how, how, how do you look at that intersection of the fourth industrial revolution and the global challenges we're, we're, we're trying to address? Yeah, um, this has been a great summit. I mean, I think we, we all got here and on day one got into first gear, which felt challenging but comfortable. We were addressing the world's big problems and working out how to do that. And then Professor Schwab gets up and challenges us to move into fourth gear with the fourth industrial revolution. And suddenly we've all got to up the tempo of our conversation 
and think afresh. And I think it's been, it's been, it's made the summit really a great summit. And I guess I would share three reflections. Um, they're not my own. They've gleaned from conversations with the with the brilliant people in this room about what the fourth industrial revolution might mean for global cooperation and for the collaboration of the kind that the WEF is trying to facilitate. And I guess the first, the first observation or the reflection, which came when a young Emirati official came to our Global Agenda Council on global governance and very quickly made us realize that we were all the pre-millennials and, you know, no offense, but most of us in this room are what I would call the pre-millennials. So how do we see institutions? We see hierarchy. We like that. It's comfortable. We see reputation and brand as important. We look at careers within institutions. And we accept a certain slowness as a result. And yet we're designing institutions and collaboration platforms for the new millennials who have a very different view of those four things. They don't go for hierarchy, they go for flat organizations. They don't go for reputation and brand, they go for projects and delivery. Um, they're not going for careers, they're looking at collaborative models which are constantly shifting. And they certainly aren't tolerating slowness, they're going for speed. So for me, the one, a first reflection brought by somebody from our host country here in Abu Dhabi was very much that we've actually got to think in a more millennial way about the institutions that we're designing. I guess a second thought was, um, was about reflecting on what Professor Schwab laid out for us yesterday on the Industrial Revolution and the extent to which the new technology embeds norms. Now, it might be the self-driving car that Elda referred to and whether it runs over a dog or a child or it might be an automating drone or robotic warfare. But if the new technologies are going to embed norms, then we need really fantastic global processes for generating those norms. And I think that's a new, it, it really ups the challenge on what kind of collaboration we have to develop deep norms which are going to be embedded in these new technologies. I guess my third reflection, um, and it, I, I rather liked a quote that, that I heard earlier today, which is that architecture, um, now what was it? Architecture gives us the illusion of stillness when the world around us is moving very fast. And I think it's a reminder of why we have institutions, that we can all talk about nimble, rapid change, but we have institutions to give us that moment of stillness in which we can build trust with one another, get to know one another. You know, one of the reasons why I think this summit has worked even better than others is because a lot of people here know each other. This is an institution and it's, there's a lot of trust that's been built. And so that moment of stillness makes me pause and say, let's not throw away all the institutions we've got, but let's remember that we actually do need though, that stillness to build trust which makes collaboration possible, which will make the kind of speed and agility that we need possible. Those, those were my reflections. So, so, so in a way you're saying we need the, the stillness of the institutions to develop this process of, of norm setting? Is that, is that the, um, the, uh, the way we can, we can, uh, we can establish these, these norms at the global level? Well, I think we've got to be careful. So stillness does not mean paralysis. And a lot of international organizations one could describe as paralyzed, and that's not what stillness means. I think the moment of stillness in a busy world is more telling us that we need the reassurance that our best efforts are not just evanescent. The reassurance that if we engage with one another on a collective solution, it's not all for nothing. And that's what an institution can do. It can give you a platform that you can keep coming back to that makes it worth you putting your energy and efforts into because there's a sustained process which will actually impact right. something. Right. Did that, w were there other thoughts in other councils that, that resonated with that, with that argument that Nairi has just laid out about that, uh, um, in a way, the uh, dilemma between, between stillness and, and, and the speed that we need in these 
in these new institutions. Were there any other thoughts from, uh, from, from councils that relate to this, to this point? Michelle, in the um, value. Thank you. <laughs> so I'm in uh, the Justice Council, and, and we were uh, grappling with this issue a lot, not just in our own council, but also in our cross-council sessions, uh, the question of justice and how justice institutions have been probably among the slowest to... Um, uh, to adapt uh, to the to the amount of speed that the new generations are asking, um, so uh, you know if I go to a court and it takes too long, well I just will uh, sort things out myself, right? Um, uh, the, the one one of the um, ideas that, has, that, that we've been uh, implementing on has been uh, issuing um, uh, innovation, innovating ch justice challenges uh, at the regional level. Uh, so if we are not really finding uh, the solutions within the institutions, we're trying to find it you know, among the kids with blue hair doing hacking stuff in their <laughs> backyards. Um, but uh, but we, we've actually found some really amazing uh, innovations there. Stefan, I, yeah. I would comment to your question, if I may. Um, so I was reflecting on, on what you said, Nari, about uh, in this last point, and I think that really is um, the same lens of, on, on this question of are we investing enough in the infrastructure by which we, we tend to think in, you know, um, bridges or buildings or these days telecommunications or others, but it is it is in some ways the institutions you're talking about that, that require um, a common ground for all the different things that have to be integrated to come together. And it, I just, I hadn't thought of it quite in that way, but it strikes me that they're, they're the flip sides of the same, of the same issue. Because without, without that, that stillness, we're not going to get these different perspectives to come together in any meaningful way. Sarah. Yeah. Um, I guess, um, so I sit on the Africa um, GAC, and, and I think this is something that came up thematically for us in terms of, you know, as, as a group, what we really think about are what are the most pressing challenges for the continent, and then where do we want to be policy advocates? Where do we want to push things forward? And this struggle between the immediate need, taking it away from the focus of the long-term 25-year policy advocacy that we also need to be doing. And so sometimes there is this tension of, the short-term immediacy of certain things, right? So you feel like you're driven off just emotion, pure emotion and, and drive to fix something today, I think makes us forget about how we also push for what the world is gonna look like in the future. And, and I do think it is, you know, it is ultimately this, this stability that allows us to, to, to have to toggle between the two. But my fear is, is actually that, um, the focus on process can somehow stifle innovation and change that we need because, because if we're constantly trying to get ready for what's coming, we're never going to be ready for anything. And so sometimes it's, it's okay if, you know, mistakes, just like mistakes were made in, in, in we're allowed, you know, we're allowed to make mistakes in the private industry or in business. I think government should be allowed to make business but learn how to iterate fast enough to, to, to kind of you know, pull backwards if, if necessary, et cetera. So it's, it's really this balance of addressing immediate needs, but really thinking for the future, because if we don't think 25 years at a time, I think we will struggle with really, you know, solving any world problem. Right. So thinking about the long term, uh, Professor Schwab, did you, did you want to come in? Do we have a, do we have a microphone? After having complicated maybe our discussions yesterday by bringing in the dimension of the fourth industrial revolution, I was just thinking during our session, what would I, what slogan would I create for everybody of us leaving the room? And it has to be very short, uh, incorporating the different uh, contributions which were made. For me, the slogan will be, Smart with heart. <laughs> okay, Elder, you had another point. Um, uh, yeah, I was going to comment on Nairi's point about the fact that we need institutions and stillness. I, I want to second, I think we re literally need it. I think we have very limited bandwidth, which we fail to appreciate. Uh, 
you know, the millennials do multitasking, but really what they're doing is being distracted. Uh, and and it's, it's something that we fail to appreciate fully. If you put people on a, in a simulator speaking on a phone, no hands held, just cell phone in the car, their reaction time and their ability to detect the periphery equal what in the U.S. would be legally drunk. <laughs> it, it, very quickly, we lose it. And the very limited bandwidth we have, all of us, is that what we need to do to be intelligent in the conversation at the WEF and make sure we eat healthy and help our children with our homework, it's a lot to do. And so in, in some profound way, I think the stillness that comes with institutions that function real, reasonably well is, is needed right. for us to be able to have a moment to think intelligently and originally. So I think this is, this is an interesting point. To what, to what extent, uh, because Nairi, you focused um, a lot of your point on, on this generational shift, right, and the, and, and, and the changes that this brings about. But to what extent is that not also a more fundamental uh, change in the way systems operate, right, in, 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 in the way uh, technology operates in, in fundamentally different way. In, in some ways, the, uh, the emergence of the institutions that we know are, are inherently linked to the previous rounds of, industrial, uh, of, of industrialization in some ways. So to what extent is it, is it more than a generational thing and, and, and the behaviors of, of, of the millennials um, that, that, that Elda was... Well, I, I think some things stay constant. It's really interesting that the head of the GAC on the internet um, said that they actually spent quite a lot of their time talking about trust building. And, and you know, that remains a constant. Hmm. So human being, yes, the millennials have new ways of communicating, collaborating, and delivering, but they're in search of ways to find trusted partners. Collaborative work, if you're not individually seeking your career up through the hierarchy, if you are undertaking this collaborative project delivery option, you need really trusted collaborators. So it doesn't, it doesn't create a world of individual atavists. It creates a world, I think, where you need even better collaboration. So you need more trust. And, and some of the old elements give you that. So, you, you know, it is a mixture. Is there anyone from the, uh, from the Values Council? Because it would be interesting to look at that that, that point uh, from, uh, from, from, from the perspective of the discussions that you had there. A anyone from Values still in the room? Hi. Um, I'm actually not from the Values Council. I've been talking great to the Values Council. We're from the Nanotechnology Council, and you would think that perhaps wouldn't really fit so well, wouldn't you? <laughs> Um, we've been talking, and we have a very boring word for it, unfortunately, smart with heart is much better, which is responsible innovation. So how do we achieve um, the, the benefits that these technologies promise whilst not causing more problems than we solve? But also, how do we involve society in that? And I worry your point about these institutions uh, needing to design processes to engage society. I think society is going to get on with it without you. And therefore, how do we actually think of more bottom-up um, engaging processes in innovation rather than this sort of top-down aspect of it? Now, I know that's very much what you're saying, um, but it's sort of a whole new paradigm of collaboration. And in terms of some of these new technologies, there is some quite innovative thinking going on in that area that I think bringing together governance, um, innovation, and civil society will have some, some interesting lessons for the future. And I'm slightly more hopeful being on that nanotechnology council than perhaps you would have thought I might be, um, given the fourth industrial revolution's concerns that we had um, brought up earlier. Thank you. Stuart, over there. Yes, I'm Stuart Wallace from uh, the vice chair okay. of the Values Council. And I think we see values, and it fits a bit with Nari's point about norms earlier, and obviously Klaus's um, with heart bit, because we see values of both helping us get both the direction we want to where we're trying to get to, and we also see it as crucial in this much more atomized world we're moving into as providing the motivator and the means to get there. So having that values discussion is going to be important at all levels. It will be bottom up and top down, but we need both. And we absolutely need values for both goals and help us get there. Otherwise, we won't make it. So, in the front. Thank you. 
I'm Jeff Lippmann. I'm from the um, New Models of Tourism Council. And we had a slightly different issue when looking at all of these things. We couldn't quite grasp how to even explain to ourselves where we fitted into this change. On the one hand, for 20 years, we've been explaining to people that travel and tourism, I mean, not just tourism, but infrastructure and, and all of the soft and hard infrastructure does really good things, jobs, trade, development. And on the other hand, we suddenly find ourselves, we're in the middle of migration and refugee, and our strategies of trying to get across borders are suddenly turned upside down. And we couldn't even explain to ourselves what it is that we are now in this fourth revolution. And then I'm telling this story because at some stage, Klaus came into the room and we presented him with this problem. And he stopped for a moment and he said, impact tourism, that's what you are. You're good impact and you're a questionable impact at the same time. And you have to see how the new challenges and the new technologies can be fitted into that kind of framework. So you're not only the creator of the forum, you're also a brilliant ad man. <laughs> Thank you. I think that, that, that's a really interesting point you're making here about, about reframing. And, and, and I think that's, that's interesting in this context of the World Economic Forum and in, in the context of these, um, these council discussions that we're having. Because, um, and I think, Diana, you, you mentioned that, um, that we also need to reframe how we look at the problems, not, not only um, the, uh, the institutions and the approaches, um, but, but reframe how we look at the problems. What, what would you say are some of the, uh, some of the ingredients of, of, of reframing we look, the way we look at these, these problems, the way we look at the, the world? It builds on, on the previous point, which is that um, one of the, the powers of a good discipline is that it has a systematic approach to viewing a, a, a problem. And so if you're an engineer, there's a certain worldview to that. If you're a lawyer, there's a certain worldview to that. If you're an economist, there's a certain worldview to that. And, but as with the data within organizations or anything else, th those are limited in their own way. And, and you know, we talk a lot about multidisciplinary uh, approaches, but um, that would sort of take the view that, oh, all you need to do is get an engineer and an economist in the room, and they'll, they'll have a conversation, I'll get fixed. That, that's part of it, but I, I do think it's about um, forcing both to see the, the problem differently. And, 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 and so this question of, the framing, and you, Elder, have talked a lot about this. I mean, it really matters how you ask an individual question. It really matters how you frame a problem. Uh, you know, is it uh, climate change or is it global warming? I mean, th those things have made a huge difference in how people think about what, what problem we're trying to tackle there. Is it, you know, so on. And, and, and again, my, my plea would be for, for all of us who are part of these institutions and others that we don't spend enough on on, on that aspect of it, on what are the, the mechanisms that, or the institutions or the processes that are going to enable that kind of interaction? Elda, from a behavior science perspective, what would be your one piece of advice and how, how should we frame global challenges to make it more, more likely that we come to positive collective outcomes? I was thinking that uh, what I would, so we talk a lot about institutions as a, as a place to gain efficiency. I think it's an issue of responsibility, and I think the comment on values brought it up to me. Um, the social sciences are filled with examples of people with wonderful values doing terrible things. Uh, and it's really about the design of how, it, you know, the institutions and the, and the societies were design. There's a real breakdown between intention and action. Now, sometimes it's obvious. So if you teach the poor about eating healthy and send them home to a food desert where they cannot find a fresh piece of fruit and vegetable within three kilometers, obviously it's not gonna help them. The US spends an enormous amount of money teaching the poor about financial literacy and then lets them enter the unregulated financial disaster of the American banking system where they fail. Now that's a clear case. Other cases are more complicated, but basically what institutions do is allow people with good values to function well to basically deliver on those values as opposed to not. And I think that's a place where, how you think about institutions, that's your point, 
It's a very different story. It's really about, again, it's the nuance that lets you to act well in a classroom, in a business, in the street, as opposed to not. I was just going to pick up the lady um, at the back who said, you know, all this talk about processes and mechanisms and institutions, um, because it does sound a bit like a sort of deformation professionnelle of people working on global governance. But it's really just to recall that human beings do wonderful things collectively. You know, they can create life-saving drugs and they can create factories to produce those. And those factories can pollute the river which becomes toxic to another village living down the stream. And for that reason, because in any society in the world, let alone in the world itself, human beings will always be acting collectively in ways which adversely affect others, whether it's intentional or not. So whether you like it or not, you actually have to design processes which make those human beings realize that it's worth investing in that process to come to an agreement without killing one another, without further endangering one, one another's lives. So not optimal, but with enough buy-in because all parties agree that the process is fair. So although it sometimes seems tedious, it's less exciting than thinking about the individual and the bottoms-up project, this attention that the WEF is playing to how we can design processes of collaboration is really important because there's not a society in the world that doesn't need to use those processes to make it possible for individuals and communities to flourish. Thank you, Nairi. Uh, final point from... Oh, I, I just a, a very quick point uh, that, that was raised by, by several points here, which is um, so often when we think about global challenges and we think about the world we're trying to create, improving the state of the world, as, 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 as the WEF has always um, aimed to do, um, we conceptualize it as achieving an ideal. We're moving toward an ideal in the future of government. We're moving toward an ideal. In, and I would just say that if I took one other thing away, other than uh, the point I made before, it's that that is a flawed way of thinking about it. That at the end of the day, the solution to one problem will create a different problem, and that solution to another problem. And so the need for the process and the continuous evolution of answers to things, um, whether it's software development or policy or anything else, um, that, that we've gone through a, a cycle of thinking about challenges as the challenges we're solving today as we perhaps create other challenges, and that we embrace that and, and make that part of the processes themselves. Thank you. And this is a fascinating discussion that is, that is hard to cut off, but, uh, but, but we are running against the uh, end of the, 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 the time here. Uh, but it's really not to say that, that we should end this conversation here, but actually start that conversation. And if I learned one thing here is about attitudes can change faster than, than social norms. Well, I felt that the attitudes at display at this summit, uh, if, if, if there are any indication of uh, the, the progress that we can make on those issues, then uh, I'm personally relatively optimistic. Um, so let, let me thank the panel uh, for, this, for this fascinating final uh, discussion here uh, today. Um, and uh, as, as we're bringing this, uh, the, the summit to a close, We'll just do a quick uh, preparation here on, on, on stage uh, to invite the, uh, the co-chairs uh, of the meeting. Thank you. <laughs>